Hello, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Some of you depends where you are. This is Kazem, Kazem Poor. I'm President CEO of Amaris Clinical Research. Uh, from training point of view, I'm a statistician and I've been in the clinical trial business since late 80s. And I've been uh, in academia teaching statistics and biostatistics and currently in George Washington University teaching epidemiology and biostatistics. And uh, from the pharmaceutical point of view, being on all side of pharmaceutical aspects of it, and also worked in FDA as a statistical reviewer. The topic that we're going to talk about today, uh, I know some people are still joining, so I'm just uh, going to talk a little bit in general till uh, maybe two, three minutes, so other people are joining. The topic is enrichment strategies to increase the statistical power and potentially reducing the sample size in clinical trial. This topic has been around for some time, and I do know uh, people are attending are not necessarily a physician or clinical trialist. They are from different backgrounds. So I'm going to give some general view of some of the terminology that are very essential in this aspect. So I am going to start by giving you the concept of proof of concept and exploratory trial versus confirmatory clinical trials. In clinical trials, especially in COVID era now, you have heard a lot, uh, this, this trial is on phase one or phase two or phase three, but that's another terminology that is used, phase one, phase two, phase one B, phase two B, and things of that nature. But no, I'm gonna focus on uh, proof of concept and or exploratory clinical trials, and then confirmatory clinical trials. Typically, confirmatory trials are phase three trials that are confirming a hypothesis that is generated in the earlier phases of the clinical trial, being phase one, being phase one B, being phase two, any uh, way that you may call it. But bottom line is that the hypothesis is generated through a clinical trial, either exploratory clinical trial or proof of concept or phase two and any from inpatients. And then we conduct a confirmatory clinical trial. The, the, the main purpose of separating these two is to focus on the population that is used in confirmatory clinical trial. I use the word population, and the reason for it is that in confirmatory clinical trials, the moment that we are doing randomization, probably again in COVID era and the vaccine trials probably you have heard quite a lot that uh, it was randomized between control and real vaccine or placebo and things of that nature there is a randomization and after the randomization before the randomization you can do a screening you can exclude patients and having inclusion exclusion criteria and all that thing but after randomization the population that they are randomized, those are the ones that will be used in statistical analysis. And there are typically three populations that we are dealing with. One is called per protocol. That means they, those subjects, those patients, they followed the protocol according to whatever it was from inclusion exclusion criteria, if it was that has to be aged between 50 to 80. If a patient is 49, that should not be in the trial, however, accidentally came, and that will be put aside. Or if patient did not follow the protocol, did not take all the cl clinical product. So all that thing will be per protocol. Then there is another population, and that is the one that was randomized and was intended to be treated. It's referred to ITT. And that's the one that will be analyzed in the trial, in the, in the analysis. And that's the one that's really ITT population is the one that we will focus on when it comes to the analysis. And then the third 
population is safety population. And that one is anyone who has taken at least one dose will be part of the safety population. Okay, let me see. I am going to, okay. Let me start by talking about enrichment strategy for clinical trial. Most of what I am presenting here from you to you is from the guidelines and also I borrowed some from Bob Temple's presentation. And this concept of enrichment really has changed quite a bit over time. And the guideline came out, the first draft of it came out in 2012. There have been different versions of it, and those of you who are involved in dealing with the uh, regulatory agencies, there are uh, changes in it, and depends on what the strategy is, you need to have simulations and all that thing that I will talk to you in more detail. Uh, defining it from the guideline, it says enrichment is the prospective use of any patient characteristic. That patient characteristic can be demographic, can be historical, can be genetics, or any other characteristic of patients that you are going to use to select the study population that you are going to randomize, in which the belief is that it will help to detect drug effect more likely than in the general population. So you are selecting population based on some prospective characteristic of that population. And that characteristic can be uh, genetics, can be laboratory marker, can be, we'll talk about it in more detail. But that's the definition of enrichment population. Give you some feeling about it. This is again, I borrowed this one from uh, Bob Temple's presentation, as you can see. This is a uh, Kaplan Meyer on the x axis here. It's time over years, and y axis is percentage death. And then you can see that we are looking at one characteristic, and that's the PSA. If PSA is less than two, it can be between 1 and 2, it can be between 0.5 and 1, it can be less than 0.5. The percentage that are dying over time is very, very, very small. But look at if the PSA, this is the characteristic that we are talking about, is larger than 2, really the death rate is very, very large. And this is and then when we are going to do a clinical trial, probably we're going to focus on that particular population. There are three, generally speaking, there are three enrichment strategy as a whole. And these three enrichment strategy <coughs> can be looked at from many angles. I, I, I will talk to you about them when I talk, you may say, that yes, this is done in almost a lot of clinical trials. What is called the practical enrichment? That basically the purpose is to reduce the heterogeneity and reduce the variability. As you know that variability and heterogeneity is one of the main problem in conducting clinical trial. And you have to try to have as, as much homogeneous as you can. Then the next type is prognostic. That's, a, again, another characteristic, the prognostic, and or statistically speaking, a stratification and or covariate. This is another types that we can enrich, use enrichment strategy based on that one. And the third one is predictive enrichment that basically anticipate or identify potential patients responder to that particular drug. The first two, really, we, are, we have been using them. You may not have called it uh, enrichment. You have used different criteria, different terminology. As I say, the covariate or stratifications or prognostic factors and things of that nature. And you, you have used that one. But let me uh, give you more example on this one with respect to enrichment strategies.
for some reason. Okay. Uh, starting with the practical enrichment. As I said, the main purpose is to reduce the variability or heterogeneity. As I said, this is one of the one that is very common. And we can, when in any clinical trial, we have inclusion exclusion criteria that is can be looked at as uh, one en enrichment strategy. And you are choosing patients or subjects who will comply and they will not have dropouts. If you are dealing with diabetes, you don't bring patients with uh, HbA1c larger than 12 and things of that nature because you, you are hoping that they, they, they will be one of those that may drop out. And, and eliminating, and that's another one that people use that eliminating placebo responders or it's a leading per, in the lead, washout period or leading period and eliminate people with a potential disease that likely that they will lead to early withdrawal. This is very, very common and we don't call it enrichment, but that's one of those. The next one is prognostic stratification. This one is used more often since uh, late 90s, especially when with enrichment, with the stratification we are using, with the prognostic we are using, these are clinical terminology that we do. But with covariates, doing quote unquote analysis of covariance, you may have seen that one. But the main purpose again is that identifying and selecting patients or subject with more chance of having an event. And also, we want to make sure that when we do that, selecting this, uh, doing a stratification, because uh, let's, 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 let me give you a strategy. Gender can be one stratify, stratification, male versus female. You are going to separate, in the male, you are going to have the same number of placebo and active in the female. And then there is a difference in response between each gender. And you are going to compare active and placebo in female, active and placebo in male, and then combine them together rather than <clears throat> doing uh, randomly selecting and all of a sudden you may have in the active or you may have more male than female and vice versa that it will be a confounding factor for you uh, obviously when you are doing inclusion exclusion criteria you don't want to have uh, labeling Im impact because if you are excluding one characteristics when it comes to the marketing you won't be able to have that one in your trial and you have to exclude them. But the one that I'm gonna emphasize on is the predictive enrichment. And that's the one that really is the most recent one. And that's the one that a lot of uh, emphasis they're gonna make on that one. This is basically choosing patients that have more chance to respond to your clinical product. Again, the patient characteristics for this one can be genomics, or can be laboratory marker. I, I will give you examples, and all those examples really, except one of them, the first one, but the rest of them are from uh, the guidelines. It can be based on the history of response to similar molecule, molecular ent entity, so similar, similar drug. Or you may use some surrogate endpoints, some, sur some laboratory marker, tumor response or not respond or a lab some measurement again going back to diabetes you can look at hba1c as one of your measurements or looking at uh, in hiv using cd4 cell count or viral load as your one of the uh, endpoint surrogate endpoint that you are using to to exclude or include in your model in your clinical trial also the past response to the test drug or similar drug that's another one and one of them that is again you may have seen this one removing the placebo responders that's the the one that it's happening in enrichment strategy more often than other one now let's focus on this slide this this one here i'm going to show to you what do i mean by uh the enrichment and that is that 
as you can see here, we have all patients, and we are randomizing. In this case, I chose three to one ratio. You can choose uh, two to one ratio. You can choose four to one ratio. Typically, when we are talking about three to one ratio, typically it is three active, one control. But in this particular trial, the purpose was to exclude as much as we can the placebo responders, because if the placebo responders in our in your trial, then the delta between active and placebo is going to be smaller because a portion of those placebos are responding. So in this particular enrichment trial, what we did, <clears throat> we randomized three to one, and then one was to active and three to placebo. Then we went for a period of time. It can be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. It, it, we, it depends on the period that we will discuss with the clinician, that we believe in that period of time, placebo responders will show themselves. It used to be called the white coat effect or whatever you may call it. And then the active R will continue. We don't do anything with it. But the, con the control arm or the placebo arm, after a period of time, we measure the endpoint that we have in mind. It can be a surrogate endpoint. That means a replacement for the true outcome, clinical outcome, or it can be a cl the clinical outcome. So after that period of time being two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever period of time is, if we are talking about HbA1c, probably you want to have it for six weeks. And then you will measure that marker. And there are some that although everybody was on placebo, they will respond. If they responded, you don't want those patients in your trial. You'll exclude them. You will discontinue those subjects or those patients. But those that were non-responders, you will start randomizing them again to a placebo arm or an active arm. Now, the, what we did, we enriched population, and basically what we did, we excluded all those that potentially were placebo responders. <clears throat> you may say that why did we even need the control, the active arm to start with? Because if you told everybody that this is a washout period, everybody's on placebo, no one is going to show or, or, or say that they are a responder because the, the thinking is they are on placebo, therefore they should not respond. Obviously, if you are measuring an objective measurement, HbA1c and things of that nature, they cannot lie. But if you are doing a subjective measurement, they know they are on placebo, therefore psychological effect that is. So as you can see, this is enriched population. At the end, the one that you will compare is the control R with the active R for those who were not responding to the placebo. Now, the purpose is that the plan is, or the hope is, or the belief is that these patients here, they are on placebo, will not respond. And only the one that will respond are the active R. And also we have this active R here that we can compare this to active R. But from the confirmatory point of view, I will talk about type 1 error and alpha and things of that nature. This, uh, this two placebo arm and active arm from the non-responders are the ones that really are the essence of the clinical trial that you are doing. Now, let me give you a few more scenarios for the enrichment. Again, this is from the guidelines, by the way. All subjects. And then we do a testing on a particular marker it says a marker it that it doesn't need necessarily to be a marker imagine that you are testing a beta blocker and in that beta blocker you will look at those who have diastolic blood pressure more than i'm throwing a number 95 and if it is less than 95 you put them in this category if it's more than 95 you put them in this category those who are less than 95, then you randomize them to active and placebo. There is, this is another one. Again, all patients, 
all market tested <clears throat> those who are positive you randomize them control and active those that are negative you randomize them positive negative this is this is really some sort of stratification can be here or say all market tested can be gender male and female Fa male randomized active control female randomized active control and this one is a little bit more complicated but all of them are enriching your population really here is all subjects but in this particular one you cannot really identify them unless you give them the the treatment so they have to be after randomization and then so you get subjects you randomize them you give them the active treatment then you will see there is a marker those that are positive in marker you analyze them this is one of those that really it is hard and you have to discuss with the agency and because you don't know number of positive in the active R may not be equal to number of negative in the uh, it's 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 really really it's uh, positive here negative here you may not have the same number there are a lot of confounding factor in that one so it's not one of those that really you can do that much uh, with from the enrichment point of view one thing that I like to mention is the statistical significance although the focus was enrichment but one question that always is asked that is there any impact on type 1 error on alpha the answer is it it not necessarily if you design it prospectively and if you talk to a regulatory agency and if you mention all the aspects of it that you want the answer is no not necessarily doing enrichment should impact your type 1 error or your alpha i don't go over the detail of the what what it means by type 1 error i'm sure all of you uh, by knowing the background you know what i'm talking about so i don't uh, spend time on this one just uh, uh, the main question that you may have is that will it impact type 1 error the answer is not necessarily as i say that it's it is not necessarily as long as you have specified it in advance and as long as you have discussed that with the regulatory agency, as long as if you are going to have an unblinded interim analysis, then you have to take that into account how you are going to do that and how the enrichment was designed and how you discuss it with the regulatory agency. That is the, the key aspects of it. I will talk about simulation in a moment how about the power the impact of enrichment on the strategy on, on power it, it really it can have a large impact on the power and obviously indirectly it has impact on the sample size as well why that is the case because Im imagine if you remove the placebo responders when you are randomizing, you have active and placebo because the placebos are not responding anymore. So only active arm is the response. So the delta is going to be <clears throat> larger. That is one aspect. The other one, when you do enrich, you are excluding a lot of subjects that create variability and heterogeneity. And because you are making patients to be more chance responding to your drug as a result it will have more impact on your power with respect to power it is also referred to as type 2 error rate or 100 percent or beta which is 100 uh, the, because we are converting it to percentage it is 100 times 1 minus beta but it's power known as power uh, let me talk about simulation in most cases when you go to a regulatory agency and you are going to let them know that you are going to use enrichment they may or may not know the impact that that enrichment approach that you are going to use will have on your especially type 1 error type 1 error alpha is the one that they care about the most power also they do you need to have more than 80 percent power but the alpha is the one that so to prevent in uh, 
accepting unnecessary statistical penalty, we recommend to you, if you are going to use any enrichment strategy, make sure you can do simulation that when you go to the agency, present to them that, yes, this enrichment, here's the way that we are going to do it, and here's the way that we believe will not have any impact on the type 1 error. And when you do the simulation, really there are so many aspects of it that you can take advantage of because there are so many aspects in clinical trial that obviously the old approach of doing <coughs> phase one and then phase two and then phase three, that's the old one. And then when you are trying to really take advantage of all the regulatory agencies offered methodology, which enrichment being one of them, adaptive trial being, I know you need to do a little bit more work and then go to the agency the one-to-one -one ratio uh again not necessarily you should do one-to-one -one ratio you can do one to two ratio you can do one to two three ratio uh, what do i mean by that is uh, if we are going to use 150 subjects you don't need to have 75 active 75 placebo you can have 50 and 100. what is the pros and cons again if you do the simulation you will see that <clears throat> obviously in your simulation uh, the nature of the endpoint is it a continuous or, or dichotomous? It, that's going to have impact. A statistical test that you are using, I'm sure all of you have used some uh, stat methods 101. You remember there was a Z test and T test or chi square and Fisher exact test. All those tests, each of them has some power that may be different to other one. Depends on the nature of the data that you are using. Again, I am talking about the endpoint, and that is why I'm saying that the interim analysis, you have to make sure that you are talking with the agency if you are going to do it, because that is one that definitely will have impact on your type 1 error. Then the adaptive trial design, as I say, this is another aspect that lately more and more companies are using it. You can use both enrichment strategy and adaptive clinical trial design. We are doing it, MRX is doing it for a lot of companies. And it is really, really a very, very powerful. And uh, we recommend it. But at the same time, we say that make sure you talk to a regulatory agency if you are going to use adaptive trial design, regardless of enrichment or non-enrichment. With enrichment, definitely you need to do that. Uh, I went a little bit too fast. But just what is the take home message? Uh, I just say that yes, there are three types of enrichment the practical enrichment, and all three of them really the same intention. The intention is to increase the power, to, to increase the power, to reduce the sample size if it's necessary, if, if you can, and to make sure that the variability is less. Uh, practical enrichment was one of them. Prognostic enrichment was another one that, again, uh, we have done that one. And then the predictive enrichment is the one that identify and randomize potential responders or exclude the placebo responders. <clears throat> In confirmatory clinical trial, really doing enrichment, it helps you to reduce the cost. And it can also reduce time to the completion, obviously, and increase the patient recruitment. Somehow, depends what you are doing with enrichment, it may help you in patient recruitments as well. With respect to regulatory pathway, again, as I mentioned it over and over, communicate it with them and present to them simulation to show to them that, yes, the impact on type 1 error is very minimal. The impact on power is more, which is good. And uh, with respect to adaptive, I would definitely, with enrichment or without enrichment, I would recommend to use adaptive trial designs. But uh, with enrichment, you can do that. If you are going to do adaptive, make sure you be very, very specific what type of adaptive you are going to use. The statistical impact on using enrichment in trial design, yes. When you know you are going to use enrichment, then really make sure that the methodology that you are using 
and the statistical uh, approach that you are using. It, it is really appropriate for that enrichment methodology or that adaptive trial design that you are using. I was told to do it in 30 minutes. It is 31 minutes, so I stop here. And I'll be very happy if you have any question or comments. Thank you, Dr. Kazampour. At this moment, anyone who has questions can type those questions into the pane on the right-hand side of your screen. We currently don't have any questions for you, Dr. Kazampour, but we'll give it another minute. Alternatively, if you have any questions and would like to reach out to Dr. Kazampour or to Patrick Burke, um, we can display his information on this next screen, Dr. Kazampour, if you can advance to the next screen so we could have contact information up there. Sorry, it seems there were some people at the beginning who could not hear us. I hope they fixed that. So Dr. Cosmoport, it doesn't appear to, we don't appear to have any questions at this moment. Is there anything else that you would like to add to your presentation? Mm, thank you very much. The, the only thing, if I'm gonna add anything, is that using enrichment strategy and or adaptive trial design, it is very, very important because it really, it will help you for your confirmatory trial, not for, proof of concept or exploratory aspects of it. Because in the proof of concept or exploratory aspects of it, don't worry about impact on type one error, alpha and things of that nature. That is not really the main concern. Because that is the time that you are trying to learn more about your product. Do not limit yourself at that time. But when you get to the Confirmatory trial, definitely use either enrichment strategy or adaptive or both. And do not worry about the, the, the quote unquote, the statistical penalty or the impact on type one error, because you can really develop a methodology and discuss with the regulatory agency and show to them that the impact on type 1 error is minimal or even if there are some impact on your type 1 error that is one one thing that a lot of sponsors out there they are, they are afraid let's assume that the type 1 error that you are using is 0.05 and then when you do that you need to make it uh, 0.048 so the delta that only 0.002 that's the penalty that you are paying. If you convert that one to how many extra sample size you need, maybe five more sample size, 10 more sample size, 10 more subjects. In that case, really you have, yes, you are paying a penalty of adding 10 more subjects, but you are increasing your power so much. So if anything, I would say is that take advantage of these uh, enrichment strategy and adaptive trial design in your clinical trial designs. Any question now? Yes, we do have some questions that are coming in, Dr. Kazimpour. The first question is, how do you define the threshold to consider a placebo responder as a responder? Is there a general rule or is it, a specific, or is it specific to each study? That is a very, very solid question. This is really is a clinically dependent factor. Let me give you a scenario. Let's, me, let's assume that we are using a beta blocker for reduction uh, for the reduction of diastolic blood pressure and we are allowing patients to come into the trial with the uh, diastolic blood pressure being i'm throwing a number larger than 95 and it is well known they call it white coat effect that when patients go and see a doctor all of a sudden the the, the pain or the problem that they have goes away but then Okay, in the placebo responders, we see that we randomize them and the, the patient or the subject got placebo. And then all of a sudden, its blood pressure goes from whatever it was, goes become 75. When it is 75, it's low already or 80. That is the, 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 the threshold, is the threshold that 
you can see that this patient no longer has that particular disease or that particular indication that we are looking for. Because if, if you reduce someone's blood pressure from, I'm throwing a number, from 80 to 70, that's, or eight to 75, you reduce it by five. But if someone by just taking placebo, the blood pressure went down to 75, that, that patient that does not need blood pressure. So it is really a clinically defined characteristics or a delta that you think between the baseline and post baseline you think that that is large and uh, it is clinically defined and depends on the on the disease and the indication that you are working with i hope i i could answer your question thank but this you. is a very good question and you need to identify that one in advance yes Thank you. The next question is, what would be the effect on combining enrichment strategies and adaptive designs? Would the agency be okay with that? And what would be the potential complications? The answer is yes, they will be in agreement with it. Depends what, actually we went over there a few years ago was with uh, one of our sponsor and uh, we were using both enrichment and adaptive. And at that time, Dr. Bob Temple attended the meeting. And the very first question that asked us, what are you trying to adapt for? That was the question that they asked. So let's assume there are two types. Of, let me give you some extreme adaption. We start with the placebo, low dose, high dose. And then we are going to do an interim analysis. I will talk about enrichment as well. And then after interim analysis, we may want to drop the non-effective dose, let's assume the high dose was non-effective or low dose was non-effective. And then from that point on, we are going to go only with two arms, placebo and that dose that we chose. Okay, this is adaptive. You start with three arms. See, in old days, we always start with three arms and we went till, till end for three arms. There is no reason to do that. You can drop one arm, adapting it. Okay. And then the enrichment can be that you had at the beginning, you had a washout period or placebo dropout period. So at the beginning, you had it that you randomized them with the active and placebo and have them there and then do it with that. So it, it depends on what you are going to adapt. If the adapt adaption is moving from, uh, depends what you are adapting, but all these have to be specified in, in advance and should be discussed with the agency. And yes, the, they they do, depends on, on the divisions, obviously, obviously when you are talking about FDA or even MHRA, they, they have different divisions and they have different understanding, but always simulation will be the one will help you to show them the impact on type one error is very, very minimal. And it Any looks other? like we have one we have one more question, Dr. Kazimpour. Are there certain therapeutic indications that are more or less appropriate for adaptive design or enrichment? Adaptive design or enrichment or adaptive design and enrichment? For adaptive design or enrichment. Oh, adaptive design for enrichment. Uh, to be very frank, these days we try it for most trials that we have, because it allows us to reach the, the end of the trial a lot faster. I, I am thinking of if there is any particular one. We do, we do uh, HIV, we do CNS, we do a lot of oncology. COVID, we have done several COVIDs. <clears throat> At the beginning, I, I'm talking about uh, March, April, March, we started with the uh, one type of population, and then later on, we went to severe and uh, critical. At the earliest stage, we started mild to moderate. And uh, in those, we, we use some of the uh, methodology that we could use with respect to enrichment. And uh, I, I can see that in any indication, I was thinking if oncology may not be appropriate, but no, I'm wrong because you can look at some uh, tumor size reduction as your marker 
you you won't be able to use it as your endpoint because the endpoint can be has to be either overall survival or progression free survival but at the earliest stage no you can use i was looking at diabetic foot ulcer again you can use as wound size reduction although it cannot be your endpoint but can be as a quote unquote laboratory marker or surrogate or any measurement no i do believe that uh, i would say that if you are dealing with a clinical trial that the endpoint is more subjective what do I mean by that? If you are looking at uh, oncology, survival is not subjective if the patient died or didn't die. Or, but if the, the endpoint is subjective, it is a scale. In COVID, we start with having a scale of, of moving from, I'm throwing a number, from a scale of five to three. Five has a meaning, meaning worst case scenario, zero is, or one is the best case scenario, and then somewhere reduction, getting closer to the, a better case. Uh, if the endpoint is a scale, I would definitely, definitely recommend somehow use the adaptive and enrichment because you you need to really make sure that your study is more powered because it's more subjective and you need to really have a better understanding of your, your treatment or your, your clinical product. Thank you for that response, Dr. Kazimpour. There aren't any other questions in the queue. I'd like to thank everybody for joining. We will be circulating a playback of this video um, via email to all of the registrants, and the video will also be posted on the MRX YouTube page as well as the NSF International YouTube page. Thank you for your time. Thank you.